Good afternoon and welcome to the Voices in Leadership, a series focusing on science and leadership. I am Betty Johnson and I have the privilege to direct this program and introduce today's guest. The Honorable Ban Ki-moon was the eighth Secretary General of the United Nations, serving two consecutive terms from January 1, 2007 to December 31, 2016. As Secretary General, he focused on mobilizing world leaders around a set of new global challenges from climate change and economic upheaval to pandemics and increasing pressures involving food, energy, and water. He also galvanized partners from non-governmental organizations, faith groups, the business community, and others active on the international stage, endeavoring to build bridges, give voice to the world's poorest and most vulnerable people, and strengthen the United Nations. He has worked to advance the world's main anti-poverty targets, the Millennium Development Goals, with a special emphasis on Africa and women's and children's health. At the height of the food, energy, and economic crisis in 2008, the Secretary General successfully appealed to the G20 for $1 trillion, a finance package for developing countries to protect the vulnerable and poor. Born in the Republic of Korea, Mr. Secretary General's childhood was scarred by war. Fighting forced his family to flee to the mountains. When they returned, he learned firsthand the value of the UN's life-saving relief aid. That experience was a big part of what led me to pursue a career in public service, he once said, pledging to enable the United Nations to provide tangible, meaningful results that advance peace, development, and human rights. Before I turn this session over to today's interviewer, Dr. Howard Coe, Harvey V. Feinberg, Professor of the Practice of Public Health Leadership. Please join me as we welcome the Honorable Ban Ki-moon to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. So Mr. Secretary General, welcome. It's great to see you. Thank you, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. So you've just completed two terms, 10 years as UN Secretary General, a challenging job in a challenging and complex world. When you describe this position to students or the general public, how would you explain this role in, a, in the most simple of terms? It has been a great a privilege for me to have served this a great organization the most universal and legitimate, uh, comprising uh, all the member states of the international community. It's easier to ask that question. It may take a little bit longer time, but uh, in view of time's sake, I'll be very brief. Um, there are three most important priority pillars uh, in the Charter of the United Nations. First, to uh, maintain peace and security and make sure that everybody uh, is well uh, supported in terms of development and make sure that uh, everybody's human rights and human dignity are protected. These three uh, principles and pillars of the United Nations have been the guiding force and source of inspiration and motivation for me to serve the great organization the 7.3 billion people around the world. Mm -hmm. It's been quite uh, difficult and challenging, but I often said that uh, my job as a Secretary General, while do not have much uh, resources, much um, uh, physical power, but I have the moral voice. And I've been uh, describing my job as a person with um, working for the voiceless people. So uh, I have been uh, playing a role as voice of voiceless people and defender of defenseless people. There are so many uh, people, weak people, marginalized group of people uh, whose voices have never been carried out, never been heard by the leaders of the society. So I have been working for their voices. And there are so many defenseless people. These are something which United Nations Secretary General 
uh, should do and have been doing uh, during the last uh, 72 uh, years. When United Nations is united, uh, we can deliver a lot. We can save uh, many human lives. But when United Nations is divided, as often we have seen in the case of um, many uh, serious uh, conflict issues like in uh, Syria, then unfortunately uh, we have seen so many tragic uh, situations. So I'm asking whole world's leaders to be united so that UN can deliver what is needed for uh, a people. In 2015, you announced a number of sustainable development goals for the planet, so-called SDGs, and they encompassed a wide range of areas, including global health and well-being. Can you comment on those goals, what it means to you, and what it means for the future health of our global community? While there have been some criticisms about the efficiencies and effectiveness of the United Nations, I think this is one of the proudest a vision which United Nations could uh, present uh, to, to the world. The Sustainable Development Goals uh, has 17 goals with um, detailed 169 targets which support uh, these uh, 17 goals. It covers whole spectrums of our life and even that of uh, planet Earth. And therefore, by 2030, when we can implement in full these 17 goals with a wholehearted support and engagement and ownership by the member states, I think I can say that the um, world will be much better, much more peaceful, much healthier, much more prosperous. Where 7.3 billion people's human dignity will be respected. It's important that the member state will own these 17 goals as their own goals. Even though it has been presented by the United Nations, it is now owned by the individual uh, member states. It is by far, in the history of the United Nations, the most far-reaching and most ambitious vision uh, for the people, and in, including planet Earth. So one example of that is SDG 13 on climate action. And you were very vocal in the area of having countries work together to address global warming. And of course, the 2015 Paris climate agreements occurred under your leadership. These went into force in 2016. Now it's 2017. And here in the United States, we have a new administration whose commitment to the Paris Agreement is uncertain. Do you want to comment on where you think this is all going to go in the future? Among 17 goals, I think every goal, every goals, they are important. But I believe um, without addressing climate change phenomenon, uh, I'm afraid to tell you that the, all these uh, remaining seven, 16 goals may be spoiled, may be delayed in their implementation. Uh, that is why the member states have uh, conducted two separate negotiations. The climate change number 13 goal has been taken out and has been moving on on a separate track of negotiation to conclude a binding agreement while 16 remaining goals have been also conducted through negotiation, but they are not binding. So this is kind of a treaty. This is kind of some political declaration, a vision. But they are all in interconnected. Nothing, no goal can or operates in separation from another goals. They are all tightly interconnected. Therefore, everything must be implemented and carried out altogether. Among them, climate change is one of the most uh, vitally important ones. Why? It affects the whole of our life, and it affects our nature, our planet Earth. Uh, our 
motto is that people and this planet Earth should go together. And we have to go according to what nature tells. And we cannot negotiate. We cannot wait for nature to wait for us. And we have to tell that what science, science tells us. This has been my point of argument uh, consistently and persistently uh, to the leaders of the world. That's why I really wanted to show and lead this campaign by example, showing by example. As a Secretary General, I have traveled almost all the places, front lines where I could see for myself the very serious uh, tragic phenomenon caused by climate change. And I used, I've been sending out alarm bells uh, to the world leaders. Fortunately, the member states have been able to agree on two visions. Climate change agreement was conduct, uh, finally approved by whole 196 state parties uh, on December 12, 2015. And this sustainable development goals as a package, it was adopted by consensus, unanimity on uh, sep September 19th, uh, 2015. Mm -hmm. So these two visions which have been presented by the United Nations during my time as a Secretary General, I think are the most important one and proudest one uh, for the United Nations. Yeah. So what about uh, the current status of the U.S. stance regarding the, the Paris Agreements right now in 2017? Do you want to comment on that? U.S. played the vitally important role together with China. United States, the most resourceful and most prosperous uh, country in the world. Uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, you are second largest greenhouse gas emissions, unfortunately. Then China as number one, President Obama and President Xi Jinping, they worked very closely together with me. And I have been uh, very much grateful uh, to their leadership. Now with the change of the administration to uh, Republican President uh, Mr. Trump, I have been hearing and listening and reading some, some, cons with, uh, some concerns concerns uh, that the U.S. may not uh, wholeheartedly uh, implement this one. I have been urging through my own the press uh, interview or op-ed and in my lectures that U.S. must lead this campaign. U.S. is obligated by this uh, binding agreement to reduce at least 26 to 28 percent of greenhouse gas emissions compared to the level of 2005. Mm -hmm. If the uh, U.S. does not implement this one, or on a, if they withdraw, then this will be a devastating uh, impact to this uh, global vision. This is not an issue of uh, American political administration or president. This is something about humanity. This is some, something about our planet Earth, where current generations and succeeding generations and succeeding, succeeding generations, so millennia, they should be able to live in peace and harmony, in the affordable economic and environmental circumstances. Now, I am encouraged, while I am concerned, by such a strong commitment by the people of the United States. Like uh, big states, like California, Oregon, Washington, and even Republican dominant states like Illinois and somewhere, I think the governors and the mayors, are, they are all carrying out this uh, Paris Agreement, and big major companies like uh, GM, Coca-Cola, or like many um, big companies, they know that their success depends upon the full implementation 
of this Paris Agreement. Paris Agreement may not and cannot be a perfect solution. It's not a perfect answer. We have to improve and update and augment while review sessions will continue to take place once in every five years. The first such review conference will take place next year. So they will review what has been done. Now, I heard that uh, there are some serious concerns raised by the coal industries, even biggest coal industries in the United States. I think they are joining this uh, Paris Agreement. It's not because of the job opportunities have been uh, reduced because of climate change agreement. It's because of technology development, mm -hmm. transformative technology development. And also, um, this uh, fossil fuel is now being replaced by this other sustainable energy, like uh, solar energy and hydro e energy. Uh, I sincerely hope and urge the United States will really take global leadership. Yeah. So another major global challenge to discuss, you mentioned Syria in your opening minutes. And of course, this is a major global humanitarian challenge estimated by some to have effects on some 13 million people either internally displaced in that country or forced to live outside the country as refugees. Uh, what can we as a global community do to address uh, this issue going forward? It's one of the most regrettable things which I had to leave behind uh, when I left the United Nations. It's already been a full six years since the Syrian uh, crisis took place. In the course of these uh, six years, because of um, lack of compassion on the part of uh, Syrian leaders, and because of the lack of unity among the major countries in the region, Arab region, and also in the United Nations, particularly in the Security Council. They have shown such um, divisions in their uh, political commitment. Because of that, five million Syrian people had to leave their country, flee their countries, and becoming refugees in uh, mostly four countries, in Lebanon, Turkey, Jordan, and Iraq, and some in Northern Africa, in Egypt, 5 million. As you said, 13 million people have been internally displaced. And there are, again, another millions of people who are living under very terrible situation, besieged or hard to reach areas. So United Nations have been mobilizing all necessary humanitarian assistance, but there is a huge a shortage of uh, resources which we can deliver to these people because of lack of resources, because of the uh, concerns for security for humanitarian workers. So it's a complicated one. As of this moment today in Geneva, uh, another negotiation is going on under uh, Special Envoy, uh, Mr. Dimistra. Uh, I sincerely hope that uh, there will be uh, some uh, a good uh, resolution of this issue, political resolution. And there was another very encouraging meeting in Astana, Kazakhstan uh, last week uh, to establish four safe zones. This is a matter of uh, human dignity, human lives. So whatever there may be political differences among the parties concerned, we must make sure that uh, we have to save and protect the human lives and deliver necessary humanitarian assistance. More than 50% of the health, age, health institutions have been destroyed and damaged, and people cannot be given any health uh, assistance. And that's a huge uh, tragedy at this time. I am urging again, as a former Secretary General, uh, that the member states should unite and show them compassionate leadership.
One question related to this that's been submitted to us online is that there are many at this university and the school who, who care deeply about this humanitarian crisis. What, what can we do in the academic and educational community to try to make a contribution here? We are really uh, seriously uh, concerned and going through um, most uh, tragic uh, humanitarian uh, crises these days. It's, I think, only after uh, the end of Second World War, we have uh, 55 million people scattered all around the world. Uh, we have at least 135 million people who really need daily humanitarian assistance, life-saving assistance, without which they may die. Uh, they may not be able to maintain their uh, daily uh, living. Because of um, continuing economic uh, situation downturn, and because of um, very uh, dangerous uh, human security concerns, the international community has not been able to fully support this uh, humanitarian uh, assistance to those people. Like, I really uh, take it very uh, seriously that um, the highest learning educational institutions like Harvard University, uh, uh, the School of Health and Medical Schools, uh, they should also teach a good the students w while fostering the global visions and also make uh, try to educate the professional uh, professional doctors or health workers who can deliver all these uh, services. I'm asking uh, all the graduating students and now in the Harvard University and many other uh, universities, academic institutions, uh, they should learn how they can contribute as uh, global citizens. Uh, their professional uh, knowledge, professional career uh, may be very important, but their professional capacity uh, could be, uh, should be, uh, should be ut utilized for common uh, humanity. Yeah. Thank you. Another very difficult challenge to discuss with you is the state of global preparedness. And during your tenure as Secretary General, I know you faced challenges like uh, the H1N1 flu pandemic in 2009, Ebola from 2014 to 2016, Zika that started in 2015. Lots of discussions about how to improve global preparedness. And could you comment on that? Unfortunately, during my time of 10 years, I had to uh, encounter and face, not only me, but whole member state uh, have to um, encounter all unexpected outbreak of uh, many uh, diseases of uh, international concern, like H1N1 and uh, most seriously Ebola, mm -hmm. and then later uh, Zika. Uh, those three uh, outbreaks of uh, three uh, major concerns of uh, uh, human health uh, have brought and made the United Nations to really mobilize whole is a capacity and political uh, commitment uh, to make sure uh, that the people needed, in need of help, got to receive their uh, help. Now, when Ebola broke out, it was most serious uh, moment for international community. I immediately acted uh, to mobilize a whole international support. In fact, WHO declared it as um, uh, <coughs> the global uh, pu public, uh, you know, uh, public health, uh, public health of emergency. international concern, right, right. Uh, PHEIC. Mm -hmm. Then the, we had established a mission, UNMEER, U-N-M-E-E-R, United Nations um, Mission for Ebola Response. Mm -hmm. It was the first time that the United Nations history has established a mission, special mission for health issues. United Nations has been uh, establishing many peacekeeping missions 
politi special political missions for peace and security issues, but never in the history for health issues. It was, I think, a speediest way handled. Uh, we, had, we have just um, uh, taken immediate action by the General Assembly, uh, disregarding all these uh, bureaucratic procedures. Mm -hmm. And even United States government, under the leadership of President Obama, has dispatched 3,000 soldiers. Mm -hmm. And United Kingdom and Sierra Leone, established, uh, they sent also a few hundred soldiers to um, Liberia and uh, Sierra Leone and Guinea. This really helped in addressing uh, and countering and eliminating uh, Ebola, Ebola uh, disease. Uh, I, while it has been quite a tragic uh, experience, but I am proud that the United Nations has taken all its power and capacity and mobilizing all the resources. When uh, Zika was also declared the public health um, uh, emergency uh, uh, of international uh, concern, mm -hmm. uh, then we also uh, established uh, immediate, uh, immediate response uh, task forces. As a matter of principle, I established a high-level uh, panel uh, of um, to address the global concerns of international uh, in, international concerns mm -hmm. and established high level task force uh, led by the Dr. David Navarro, uh, who was appointed as my special uh, advisor on uh, disease control. And when H1N1 the broke out, uh, we gathered all the leaders of uh, CEOs of uh, major pharmaceutical companies of the world, uh, encouraging them to uh, uh, make uh, vaccines as soon as possible and distribute it to uh, many um, people affected. I, I know that UN has a capacity when we are united, when we are committed. I know that when UN is not united, uh, like uh, divided as we have seen in Syria, uh, we have seen so much uh, tragic uh, consequences. Therefore, I'm again urging that uh, we have to really mobilize all resources possible. It's a matter of human lives. We have to save uh, human lives. Otherwise, uh, many people will die from uh, preventable diseases. So last question for you, uh, Mr. Secretary General. Now that you've stepped out and you're reflecting on your public service, what leadership lessons do you have for our students and for future generations? When you talk about leadership, uh, it's a matter of uh, vision, first of all, how to inspire people, how to motivate the people. That's a very important one. When there is an issue, always leadership matters, depending upon how leadership people act with a compassionate, uh, compassionate uh, vision, and then we can deliver a lot of different uh, uh, results in a positive uh, manner. When leaders do not listen to the voices of the people, what the, their cons con concerns or aspirations may be, then there is always a political uh, conflict uh, breakout. Uh, all around the world. This, I've been always urging that the, to the leaders that they, sh they should listen very carefully to the voices of people and try to find out and address their concerns and aspirations. I think this is a leadership. We, when you talk about leadership, people have a tendency of believing that leadership is something great and big, but each and every uh, student, each and every professor, you have your own leadership style uh, when you really motivate your students and inspire your students. I think they can become great uh, leaders of the world or of their countries in the future. So unfortunately, uh, time is up. Uh, I hate to end this conversation, but thank you so much for being here, Mr. Secretary General, and thank you very much for your public service. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
If you are interested in supporting this program and others like this from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, please call 617-432-1318 for further information.